Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Tresca. I'm your host and committee chair of the CAR PGA. We're super excited to have Andrew Wall with us. We're going to be talking with him around a, a video regarding the Satanic Panic, the documentary, which we can't wait to dive into, but just a couple of housekeeping, and then we will um, get in further with our guests. So uh, the general housekeeping is pretty much starting to sound like a broken record, but I'm going to say it again, which is we are trying to wrap up our voting uh, at the end of this month. So that means uh, we're in March. This is basically another week to vote. So um, we have a five committee uh, board seat. So the CARPG has five board seats and a committee chair. And so I'm chair. Chair is chosen from the board seats. And as a result of that, what that means is we have four candidates in, uh, currently running. So as long as you vote for them, um, they, they get in. But we, it would be great if you voted. So we're always looking for votes. That is, just as a reminder, me, David Millions, Ted Skirvin, and Hawk Robinson. So um, I, I did that right. That's four, right? So uh, hopefully we'll get to five at some point. But as of right now, uh, voting is the most important. The voting is on the website. Uh, it does require your email. So we don't, like anyone technically could vote, but you obviously have to be a member. So we want to make sure that uh, folks vote. And I consider the health of the organization probably the most important piece. And one of the ways you determine the health of an organization is it's voting. And uh, to me, that's, that's a, a great message by itself. So seeing vote participation is huge. And I would just remind you again to vote. All right, so that's my vote uh, story. I hope you can all uh, remember to do that. And if you haven't, check the CAR PGA website and you'll see that. But I'd like to turn it over to our guest, Andrew, who I'm going to, let's see if I can spotlight for everyone. There we go. Hello, Andrew. Hey. Hey, so Andrew, you, uh, we actually came together because we were talking, you had asked the rep regarding some documents. You're talking about sort of going through the CAR PGA archives. Um, but uh, why don't you talk a little bit about who you are and, and what you're, you're doing in the, in the context of CAR PGA and, and we'll take it from there. Yeah, uh, my name is Andrew Wall and uh, I'm a documentary maker and I kind of, I've been lucky enough to sort of chase after anything that sort of like interests me over the years. Um, my producing partner, uh, I used to work for, and uh, when I said I wanted to go out on my own, he said, well, you can't do it yourself. Uh, you can't do all the producing stuff yourself, so let's partner on this. And so I went from being his employee, uh, Kyle Borne is his name, to uh, making documentaries and having him help me make documentaries. And uh, so over the years, we've made all kinds of things from music documentaries about uh, artists to uh, documentaries about art and uh, art in the, in, in the context of a, a father whose daughter was murdered brutally and he sort of channeled all his energies into his art and his pain. Um, to uh, talking about C.S. Lewis and, and uh, J.R.R. Tolkien. I've done uh, two documentaries, one called The Fantasy Makers, about fantasy writers of the uh, 20th century, and as well as The Science Fiction Makers, about science fiction. Um, both of them in a spiritual sort of context of that C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, uh, also the precursor to them, George MacDonald uh, from the 19th century. Uh, they were all very deeply spiritual Christian uh, writers. And uh, so uh, every so often when you're making documentaries, something comes along that just sort of falls in your lap. And we had a, we had a friend of mine call me one day and he said, I've got a story for you. Uh, he knew a guy who was renovating a home and the home uh, was a hoarder's house. It had garbage like up, up to the neck. And in that garbage, there was many, 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 many boxes of comic books. And right off the bat, they started pulling them going, oh, these are valuable. And so we thought it was a perfect documentary. And we started digging into it and started telling the story and searching for interviews. And then we got a call from a distant family member of the collector who we didn't know he was even alive. And uh, they said, yeah, you're going to shut this down. We're not going to give life rights and we're alive. And, you know, his mother's alive and all that. It, it turned out to be just a gong show legally. And so the broadcaster said, what else you got? And I said, my friend Derek White, the geek preacher, is in Tennessee. And uh, he loves Dungeons and Dragons. And they said, well, that's sort of interesting. And uh, I said, that's a story of the satanic panic and the religious battle for the imagination of the 1980s. And they said, good, well, we need a documentary. <laughs> so go do it. <laughs> and that's kind of how this all started. I had done a pitch a couple of years earlier, but it was never the right time to pitch it and uh, never the right broadcaster. And so up here in Canada, they uh, they said, okay, we'll switch out the comic book one and we'll do this one. And, uh, you know, we, Derek, uh, to introduce Derek, Derek White is called the Geek Preacher. You can see him on TikTok and 
and a variety of other forms. Uh, you also see him at a lot of the cons. Gary Con, Gen Con, uh, he runs the Sunday Morning Services. Derek's a pretty pretty fascinating guy. He uh, he has an absolute heart for Dungeons and Dragons, and he and and that is the story we tell the perspective of the Satanic Panic of the 1980s through his perspective. Uh, he also has a lot of friends. Uh, Luke Gygax is one of them. Gary Gygax was one of them. Uh, he met and hung out with Derek, Gary briefly before he died, but he had been a longtime friend online with him. And so that's that's sort of the nugget of uh, in sort of the core of this documentary. We also talked to Tim Cass, uh, Skip Williams, who was really interesting, and, you know, one of the early designers as well. And we interview a lot of uh, kids uh, and pastors who were really bullied uh, back in the day, back in the 1980s. I guess the pastors were kids back then, uh, yeah. who ironically now are using it in their in their ministries and churches now use it. And uh, we sort of back it all up and take a look a little bit about Pat, Pat Robertson uh, and his his uh, his uh, sort of televangelist uh, network and what they were doing, bringing Patricia pulling on uh, and then Radecki. And, and of course, the big part is the 60 minutes. But everybody, anybody who plays Dungeons and Dragons or who played it through the 80s knew uh, about the 60 minutes piece, which uh, we unpack as well. So that's kind of how we got to the dock and making it. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah, so um, we had Tim Hutchings on. He's a professor and also he uh, runs the Plagmada, which is the play. I'm going to, Tim will be mad at me later. But anyway, it was it's a documentary arch ar archive of all the former D&D stuff that people have laying around their house that he was like, these are treasures that, you know, you can't lose. But he said the number one way to have someone not want to give it to you is declare that you're interested because as soon as you're interested, people go, wait a minute, this sounds like it's value. Like they couldn't get, they were about to throw it away. And something like, whoa, hey, this sounds like you want it. So it must be good. Now you can't have it. Um, so it was fascinating because, you know, I sympathize. I think it's a challenge to try and get some of this uh, stuff done. That seems like, you know, one man's trash is another man's treasure. And then you find out somebody else thinks it's treasure too. And then, you know, all of a sudden you, your documentary that was humming along is, is not because a family member goes, whoa, this sounds like it's valuable. Don't touch it. Because you're interested in it, so you made it valuable just by being interested. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's great. So, well, um, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, it, it was a fascinating story because uh, there was the more we dug into it, uh, literally dug into it, uh, the more we sort of discovered uh, this guy was actually in the 1970s writing about what would be really valuable in the future. This is the comic book collector that we never got to tell his story, and he talked about in detail the number ones and in his pile of trash there was a box missing and we were pretty sure it was the number ones and uh, the house had been broken into after he died. And uh, oh, so that's, no. I mean, that's a great story, but we can't, yeah. maybe someday we'll tell it. Um, but legally it, it got very complicated, um, but I'm, I'm really happy that we told the Dungeons and Dragons story. So. Yeah. Well, it sounds like it fortuitously worked out for us, which is fantastic because <laughs> I, I can't wait to see it. So um, that, let's talk about that a little bit, right? So obviously this is a topic that, Gosh, so now it's the 80s, 40 years on, um, where I think this has almost become mythical, right? So people are sort of uh, looking back on this and going, was it really that bad? Or, um, you know, did it actually happen that way? Do people talk about it? So did, in, you, obviously you got, you know, we've had John on the show here, which was fantastic. I, I know, I, I don't know, Luke knows me. I know Luke. Um, John certainly. Peterson. Yep. Um, but uh, in terms of what, you you did you didn't just interview the those folks right there were other people you you interviewed what was the sort of surprising uh you know nuggets you got out of the people that, from the not the scholars but the other folks did you did you find anything interesting or different from what you expected yeah i mean really uh, at, at one point i started just saying i mean this is far more relative not just because people are playing dungeons and dragons right now mm -hmm. in a big way right it's biggest year ever um and you know part of that is being pushed online and all that but it, it was more that, like, this is sort of the granddaddy of conspiracy theories. Uh, people running around, getting people upset. Uh, people, you know, saying, you can be a hero and save the kids. Uh, we got to save the kids. And uh, this was really kind of eerie how it really is just, like, an older version of what has gone on in, the, in recent years with conspiracy theories and that kind of thing. And how people get so blindedly focused on 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 these, these causes. And so that, that, you know, and that combined with the fact that, you know, bullying is now a word that's talked about and we finally address it or most places address most schools are trying to try at the very least to address it. This was bullying in, in its, you know, in its, 
in a form of like having adults go after kids and not even caring about the kids or, or, or anything about what they were actually doing, but more just being able to shake a finger and, uh, and, and say you're wrong. And especially within the, within the Christian circles where there was just a lot of knee jerk reaction. And I, I personally saw a little bit about that from not my parents, but my, my friend's parents uh, and people within my church who even to this day still react. Um, when, when I started doing this, I had a, I had a, a festival organizer ask me what I'm, what I'm, what I'm working on. And I said, Oh, it's about Dungeons and Dragons. And his immediate response was kids kill themselves after they play that. <laughs> and I was like, um, yeah, you should probably watch the documentary. And, and <laughs> I, I don't think he will, uh, but that's sort of, you know, that's what that did. The, that echo of, of these people running around saying, no, you, this is so dangerous. You, you, you shouldn't even logically approach it. You just need to believe that it's wrong and it needs to be taken out. Yeah. And it, it, you know, I think you bring up a really good point, which was the satanic panic wasn't limited to Dungeons and Dragons. It was rooted in a no. great, broader sort of societal change. Um, certainly I've seen studies that say basically this kind of thing happens because of change, right? There's a lot of change going on in society. Mm -hmm. It's point, it's, it's pointed at youth because youth are the cutting edge of the change. So people get very anxious and then you start to see these other things spin out of it. Uh, and of which D and D was visible, but not the only piece uh, of the satanic panic, right? There were other things that were pieces of that, that I've seen and heard, uh, as well, but it's certainly relevant from the role-playing perspective. Um, and then, uh, I imagine it wasn't helped by the media who loves sort of, you know, you have Radecki clearly knew what he was doing in some ways in the sense he was courting controversy with dragging Patricia pulling in. Um, and you also had Maces and Monsters. Yeah. Who, we may never forget Tom Hanks for that. And, um, and yeah. then James Dallas Egbert, Egbert, right? So do you, do you, does that get touched on at all? Those, those two pieces, the Maces and Monsters? Oh, yeah. And yeah. I, you know, I, I, I wish we could have shown uh, Maces and Monsters, but uh that just wasn't going to happen. Uh, we, we do work, we do mention it. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of other things that uh, are simply fair use. 60 minutes is simply fair use. What they did, putting Patricia Pulling on there, putting Radecki on there. Um, and, it, and it's very obvious that 60 minutes was chasing the story. And, and they probably didn't understand the game themselves when they, when they did that. Um, and uh, they, they didn't do the due diligence, definitely with Radecki or Patricia Pulling. Um, and, and it, I, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure 60 minutes of CBS regrets doing that piece, but it's a fundamental part of the whole satanic panic, um, right. including Pat Robertson, right? The, the televangelist. Well, he had Patricia pulling on his show. I mean, he was pushing a lot of what they were saying. And I think, you know, uh, Dr. Dr. Joseph Laycock, uh, out of Texas university talks about how this weird alliance of people who just were so focused on going after the game, didn't realize who they were fighting with and arguing with. Um, Jack Schick, I don't know if you know Chick Tracks. Oh, yeah. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, he's this, like, I mean, he's anti-everything. Um, <laughs> so you had, you know, and I don't go into the documentary, but he there was instances that Dr. Laycock talked about where the Catholic Church would be, you know, talking about Dungeons and Dragons and not realizing this guy you know, they're using his tracks, but this guy is actually, you know, saying, well, he's anti-Catholic too, Yeah, right? Yeah. So this weird sort of circulation of alliances and everybody kind of like is angry at everything. And uh, so that, you know, that was a part of it. Uh, that was definitely a part of it as well, uh, talking about those. Um, but also I found, you know, when you talk about the, the 80s, the back basking, you know, the fear that, you know, music artists were putting reverse right. messages and, you know, you look at some of these shows where they're, and it's in the documentary too, where they're playing Led Zeppelin backwards. And then, you know, they're, they're saying, did you hear it? Did you hear it? And the audience is going, yeah, we heard it. And the more you look at it, you're going, it's not there, but they're hearing yeah. it. They want to hear it, right? Like they hear a few syllables that are correct. And, and uh, it just shows the sort of lunacy uh, and the group, you know, the herd mentality that was jumping on this and, you know, thinking they were hearing something because they got to save the kids from, from Led Zeppelin. Jimmy Page even talks about that, how like they had enough trouble trying to write a song, you know, <laughs> crank out all these albums and songs, you know, and it, he said, we didn't have time or the sense to be able to start putting backwards mess messages into our music. And he says, right, it's interesting the way he says it, like he could care less at this point. If they were, I'm sure he'd admit to it, but he's yeah. like, yeah, we, we, we couldn't do that. Like, yeah. 
Yeah, no, it's fascinating you bring that up because I feel like one of the things that's certainly become clear over time is that um, a lot of these are creative ideas and they're creative outlets for, for children. So you've got a, a sort of interesting alchemy that seems to happen. It's happening now again, which is the save the children. So there's a moral and ethical cause because you're sort of protecting youth in some way. At the same time, you're, you're sort of attacking them, right? So it's sort of this trade-off of like, we're trying to protect youth, but at the same time, we're attacking the youth. Like you said, I think bullying is, is not inaccurate. I think it's a very great way to put it, um, that basically these you're going after these kids who are like, I'm just trying to have fun or enjoy what I'm doing. And suddenly it's wrong. And, and you, so you, you add those two pieces together. I think the other piece that we've certainly seen when talking about this, and it's, it, there's a legacy here, right? For those of us who are older and lived through it, um, is the, the challenge of what imagination means, right? So, um, you know, there is, there is no small level of overlap that religion, in a lot of ways, you're looking and thinking about things that aren't physically, you know, here. And you've got this sort of role play where you, now you're saying, well, I'm doing the same, but it's not, you know, tied to religion. And then, you know, D&D has done it. They've, they've used, you know, demon imagery. We've seen it. We know there's the succubus and the monster manual and a bunch of other stuff. So certainly in some ways there were, there were pressure points that got poked at. Um, uh, John Peterson's, um, the art book that came out really illustrates it. When you look at some of the stuff and you're like, oh yeah, I forgot there were stuff that TSR toned down after a while that maybe, you know, we were, they were trying to be like, you know, interesting. And you're like, well, that probably set somebody off. Um, so I could see it, you know, as an adult parent, finally, you start to go, okay, actually I can see where some of this stuff people got anxious. That doesn't mean it should be a satanic panic, but there's definitely, there's a fine line where religion goes, you sound like you're you're either mocking or part of uh, stepping on my toes of what we provide to the community. And, and again, depending on where you live is very different, right? So, you know, I grew up on the East coast. It is a very different experience depending on where you grow up in the U S right. In terms of both the church and, and sort of um, the role of even creative outlets, right. In some cases, your D and D group was organized by your church. That's how you got together. That was your social platform. Uh, mine wasn't. So I imagine there was a lot of that. I was telling you before we started that we had a, a you know, D and D club and we had to call it strategy and tactics because we couldn't let the parents know that that's what it was actually D and D. So we had to pretend it was only strategy because we were trying to emphasize the war gaming aspect and not the religious aspect. Um, and hopefully that made it okay, which, you know, nobody cared enough to, <laughs> as far as I can tell, but I'm curious, you know, did you, do you talk about the legacy of sort of what, as a result of that, what happened down the road for folks who've played games like that, or even in terms of how we engage with this kind of accusations today? Yeah, well, and of course, we, we, we talk about your organization, too, which is kind of like a pivotal point. Um, you know, in, in some ways, the whole satanic panic during the 80s did sort of evaporate. But it really just sort of found a new way to come out in the 90s. I mean, Harry Potter, there you go. Yep. It's the exact same thing, right? Exactly. Uh, pretty much the same thing. And uh, so uh, your organization, really, and, and, and I, do, I do touch on it. I mean, hitting them with the facts and just consistently hitting them with the facts, which, you know, any conspiracy theory, I think that, you know, that's what you have to do. Just consistently say, no, these are the facts. This is the reality. And... Uh, I, I think the real shame of that is, you know, we talked about bullying, um, you know, those kids getting a belonging and a place, but also for like, you know, the, the kids who were capable of Dungeons and Dragons games, not just in the eighties, but the seventies, when it was a much more complex game. I mean, there you go. You got you kids who intellectually um, are engaged by it and then being told, no, you can't do this. Um, that, you know, that I think is a real shame. Full disclosure, I really didn't play a lot of Dungeons and Dragons as a kid. My my good friend across the street, uh, he played it with his cousin. And his cousin was like off the charts, brilliant, really smart kid. So he was the dungeon master. Of and so the problem was that they would play it during their family gatherings. And I wasn't family, so I would sometimes be there for part of it. Uh, sometimes I, I wasn't there. So I, I was sort of like the sidekick. Uh, we had a character called Ass that uh, I would play when I was there. Um so uh, I later on played it with a couple of people down the road, but uh, I, I didn't uh, until recently, I didn't get back into it. And now my buddies were all reinvigorated by seeing the rough cut of, of the dock. And they started, they've now started organizing Dungeons and Dragons nights, which uh, my, my friend's son actually dungeon is the dungeon master for us, which is kind of fun. And uh, I forgot how, how fun it was. 
Yeah, it, it is fascinating to come back to it uh, again as an adult, right? So the perspective as a kid and then and sort of come back at, at it as an adult is is fascinating. And, and there was definitely, um, you know, that was my experience. On the one hand, you had Dungeons and Dragons being provided as a tool for imagination and, and education. Um, certainly, we talk about the Gygaxian uh you know, terminology and language that really forced you to use words you never, you know, learn to use. My, uh, my brother recently, he made a comment where he was in, I don't know what college class, and he knew all about the medieval humors, because we had put them in a different game that he played. And he was like, yeah, I know all about that. And he was like, oh, that's a real, he's like, I thought you made that up. We're like, no, that was a real thing. And, um, you know, uh, interest in history, interest in military strategy, interest in sort of, um, all kinds of esoterica, I think, was is just a huge, massive legacy that the game leaves behind. But um, conversely, a lot of that got caught up in the other stuff, right? So people didn't see past that. And we always said the number one thing that sort of changed people's minds is they watched you play it. Once they saw you play it, they were like, oh, <laughs> A, this seems a little boring if you're not participating. Uh, B, uh, seeing it played really made it clear that um, it was more simulation than anything else. You know, one of the things that I think D&D still struggles with today is LARPing, where the assumption is that you are dressing as your character. Um, and, you know, th theatrically, that's gotten a little better, but people still just sort of, I think in a lot of ways, especially we always, I always used to keep a running uh, tally of all the cartoons that have like a D&D style episode. Um, and a lot of it is, that's the fun. The fun thing is to show people, like, you know, dressed up, but the reality is that's not usually the case. Uh, although I am known to use props. And uh, I think it's funny to sort of see how that's evolved where, you know, you're just sitting around a table, actually, uh, and that's that's pretty much the game. So um, I imagine that that was sort of the other thing, too, was sort of people, you know, we try the Carp PGA and I, we you know, I'm relatively new comparative to how long the Carp PGA has been doing this. You know, one of the things we tried to do was get to that point. If you could get to seeing the game, if you get to someone willing to watch you play. The argument was over usually. The problem was you never got that far, right? You never got to that point because people didn't want to hear it. They weren't interested. They weren't. They, they certainly weren't going to. They wanted to have a philosophical debate, not a not a debate of facts because they weren't. It wasn't about facts. Um, but it, I, I do wonder. You know, certainly this is one of the theories I've had. The the rise of streaming and video like this now has changed it massively, Matt, yeah. because it, it did seem like D and D was a secretive thing you did in somebody's basement. Um, and now that it's sort of out in the open and streaming, um, it, it, I mean, for, for a few things, one, it lends itself to being viewed because it's got, the, there is a level of theatricality to it that people forget sometimes is fantastic. Uh, and it is one of those things that it's way more fun to comprehend once you can watch it. Uh, and then people want to do it. They want to, you know, and we think that's part of its popularity. So I, do, does the documentary sort of come around to the, is there a happy ending for this? <laughs> I don't want you to give it oh, all yeah. away. <laughs> no, we we just we just ended on kids being you know locked away from their game. Uh, no, uh, yeah, absolutely. We 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 touch on today, and you know you you talk about the succubus, and it's funny from my childhood that was the one picture I remembered. About <laughs> but I mean, I mean, how can you? Yeah, that 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 is quite striking. I can see any parent going, "Wait a minute." Yes. Um. And and but you know a lot of those the the ideas and the imagery. I mean, there's a lot of it's very biblical. Or it's derived from uh, Christian medieval writers and and you know people with their imagination along, which which that's a whole other story to unpack, right? Going through vampire, vampires and, and the demons and the devil, but I you know the other thing is that I would I would rather have my my kids look at a D and D book like that and understand you know these monsters and that than sitting online uh, the way that you know kids are now stuck to screens and even worse looking at porn online. Uh, yeah. Let them let, let you know. Let them play Dungeons and Dragons, and that's, I mean that that is a real key problem now in this this now generation of being you know on a screen, um, brain development for so many reasons, social development, and then you hear you have this game that is is so great for that, and and I think that's that's kind of one of the notes that's made. I mean Tim Kask, uh, who we interviewed in the documentary, he said like back then we said we had an open door let them come in and let them see us. We'll show right. you the game. He said, we, they were always saying, you know, Gary Gygax too, like come and watch us play it. Exactly what you said. I mean, Patricia Pulling says at one point that she played for like a week solid so she could understand the game. <laughs> that's a lie. Yeah, there's no way. Um, <laughs> either that's the lie or her entire uh, crusade was a lie. 
Because right? yeah. she would have known better if she'd actually played it. And, and and I think, you know, that's why she was so dangerous that, I mean, who knows what she was thinking? Who really knows whether she had just buried all the emotion of her son, you know, which is, the story is so tragic uh, unto itself. And I truly do feel sorry for her. But, you know, was it just that she just could not ever acknowledge that maybe um, their family dynamics uh, or her not realizing her son was depressed, which is a whole other question. You know, now that surface, we talk about depression, right? We talk about mental illness of kids. Um, it's not perfect now, but at least we do that today. Uh, so the question is, you know, really, what drove Patricia Pulling? And, and, and I, I don't think anybody will quite answer that or whether she was just a huckster. Uh, I think Radecki was <laughs> 100%. Yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting you talk about Radecki. So one of the things I started doing is going through case by case, and it's exhausting. Um, but so, so do you address other cases specifically? Because, you know, it kind of came and went that what he sort of dwelled on, or was it just to him in general? Uh, we look at Radecki, we look at Jack Schick, we look at Patricia Pulling. Um, you know, we, we can't, we, we couldn't get too much into the details or, or it would be like a four hour. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm saying like for our yeah. documentary. And, and, you know, that's why I, I think, you know, you, you, we touched on before this all started, there's other documentaries out there trying to tell the Dungeons and Dragons story, but this one is not really telling the Dungeons and Dragons story. In fact, at one point we stop and say, look, there's a lot of boardroom stuff going on at TSR. There's all kinds of other things going on with Gary and Dave Arnes. That's not what the documentary is about. And I, and I, and I, I'm very thankful we did that. Um, it's really about the kids, uh, sort of, a, uh, it's, by the way, it's called the satanic panic and the religious battle for the imagination. And so it's Love really it. Derek's perspective going through it and then talking to some of his friends in ministry who lived through that, who lived through the eighties. Uh, one, one pastor, actually, she lived in the nineties, but felt the effects of, of that. And, uh, so it's, it's sort of them sharing and, and then we, we hook up with, you know, Tim Cask and Skip Williams. Um, Skip was very quiet, very thoughtful. Uh, I, I wasn't sure if it was going to be a good interview and it was an amazing interview. Um, you know, Tim talked about how these designers are, are brilliant, right? You have to be brilliant to think through a game as you're designing it. And uh, it was really interesting uh, meeting somebody who actually worked on a game like that, like Skip Williams. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. No, and you got a lot of really amazing talent. Uh, to interview which is fantastic so uh, was it were you getting them at cons or did you sort of set them up separately or how did that work you know we so some of the interviews we did separately some of it we had to do remotely because of like uh, uh because of covid uh dr laycock i, I wanted him in the very beginning mm -hmm. so dr laycock doesn't talk uh so much about dungeons and dragons at first he talks about the imagination and you know how how play um play is our imagination and what you know religious ceremony and religion is, you know, from play, right? Like our, our even from like a wedding ceremony. Well, that's yep. from us playing in costumes and ceremony and, and rules. And, and, you know, and then he goes to uh, war. War has rules too. That's exactly what he says. Um, you know, that people don't always play by them, but, you know, I, I showed Germans surrendering with the white flag. Well, there's a rule in war, right? And so that's, that's play. We're playing with our rules and I, this is the game we're playing. Um, and so that sort of moves into obviously uh, unpacking a little bit about where role-playing games came from and wargaming in particular, which I, I, I would love to go uh, play uh, Don't Give Up the Ship by Dave Anderson. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. But I, I have this nostalgic idea that it would be just this amazing thing. Uh, but we, we, so we interviewed some people remotely um, and then we did at Gen Con, or not Gen Con, at uh, Game Hall. Uh, Game Hall was sort of like the window opened. We could travel without like all these horrendous sort of rules. Uh, from Canada into the U.S. And uh, Derek kept on saying, oh, I got a friend we should interview. And I was like, oh, like, is it just a friend? Well, it was Skip Williams. Uh, oh, I've got a friend. And, you know, and, and so Derek sort of had all these buddies there that actually were in, you know, deeply involved in TSR back in the day. That's awesome. And now you mentioned there were, the other people interviewed also were folks who were in, you know, have ministries today. So how did that, yeah. I mean, that's got to be an interesting world now in terms of being a living through it and b now being in a ministry and trying to to you said some of them incorporated how's that work what are they doing yeah is... you know most churches have gaming nights and uh of them a lot of them have dungeon the dragons night it's not an issue there's a generation that probably would would freaked out that's either dead or they don't control 
they don't have the power anymore to throw these people out. And they probably, you know, I'm sure they look down on it if they see it in the church or they're, or they don't even know, right. They, they can't even recognize it. So um, that, you know, Dungeons and Dragons is a fundamental part. And like I said, again, I'd rather have my kids playing Dungeons and Dragons and making moral decisions or learning about moral decisions and learning about team and, and social rather than sitting on a phone uh, mm-hmm. watching TikTok. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And, and it's a, uh... You can't passive D and D, you know. So that's one of the things that's so interesting is, and in any role playing game, obviously, it's by its nature, it it requires, uh, it'll take a little bit of of attention and engagement, and if you want all of it, you know, um, you know, I, I, there's so many ways you can engage with the hobby, from miniatures and painting to strategy to art to you know storytelling to writing. I mean, you name it, there's a way to engage with it. Um, so it's really fascinating because it is theory, because it starts with theater of the mind. People don't always play that way, but it can. Um, it really can encompass just about every form of art, you know, there is from theater where we have, you know, we now have our own cartoons uh, to um, to basically just rolling dice and having it as a military simulation. So it, it's fascinating how far it's come. And I think one of the things that's interesting is for all the satanic panic was clearly sort of emphasizing the, not the strategic, right. It was much more the religious and sort of the the imaginative piece. Um, But it it almost felt like it didn't come into its own until recently where you got, because you, a lot of folks were sort of strategists, right. They were, they love the intricacies. They love talking about your statistics. And then of course, very complex role-playing games came out of that. You had, I always talk about my champion's character was like 30 statistics and my head would explode and Shadowrun is better now, but it used to be, but, um, you know, now only finally in the past feels like decade, are we seeing the creative possibilities of what we always knew role playing was. And there were people who certainly played that way I did, where people are really, truly role playing their characters with amazing backstory to the point that you could launch Vox Machina uh, and have a cartoon. Um, I don't know if you've seen that uh, here in, on Amazon yeah. streaming. It's on Amazon streaming. And it's uh, but, you know, that came from um critical role right so they had their own streaming and it turned into a cartoon so we've got this little this this sort of virtuous circle of media um that's really starting to to the point you know you could watch the cartoon and not know it's dnd i mean if you play dnd you know it but if you watch the cartoon you don't hear dice roll uh and there's no dm so um you know they're creating stories in the way that i think all of us were always creating them but it's fascinating because uh, D and D was getting a bad rap about all this creativity, and very often it was like, you know, I move this guy here and I do thirty points of damage, <laughs> which of course is um, now the legacy of every role playing game, computers included, as you mentioned. So, um, so this is, I mean, I, I am I'm super excited to the to the extent that, and I appreciate you mentioning us by the way. So if I didn't thank you on air, thank you uh, for including the work that the CarPGA did. I can't take any credit for that. Uh, that's Mr. Caldwell and all the luminaries who did it beforehand. Um, and and you know, I say. Well, let me ask you this question. So what is the biggest threat for role-playing games today? Now that we, we, it's not, we know it's not, hopefully not the satanic panic. What's the challenge yeah. you think that we're facing? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I think going online, obviously it's helped the game, but hopefully it doesn't become just another screen game. I, I think taking that social part out and that sort of physical rolling and all that, I think that's really important. Um, now I'm not an expert on Dungeons and Dragons either, but I, I think, you know, there is, I mean, you know, when I say the religious, uh, people out there, I'm not talking about, you know, deeply caring Christians. I'm talking about sort of the, the sort of the tribe that always has to have something, uh, to go after. And we said, we say that in the opening of our documentary, you know, uh, a really wonderful lady, uh, talks about, you know, there's people out there who always have to tell other people what to do. And, you know, how, how it must be so hard to live like that, like angry. Um, and, I, and I think that, you know, um, that would be one of the big threats, I think, to Dungeons and Dragons. Another resurgence of these people going, oh, hey, uh, remember that game? It's back. Um, but it's interesting that you talked about some of the artwork that toned it down. Or some of the artwork that really inspired the Satanic Panic. Um, I, I often wonder if some of that art that was in the original books um, that was intended for college students, right? Like it wasn't right. really intended for young kids uh, or younger kids. Um, I wonder if that would have ever, if, if the satanic panic would have ever caught fire like that without that art artwork. Um, but that, that would be one of the things I'd worry about that sort of, you know, a, a new generation of crotchety old angry people and pastors and all that. But I, I think it's pretty hard. You're, you're going against, you're, you're now not going against a bunch of kids, a small group of sort of niche players 
you're now going against the mainstream. And, uh, and, you know, they tried that with Harry Potter and that sure didn't work. <laughs> well, I think Harry Potter is probably less vulnerable at this point, given the mega status of the, of the franchise, but it, it is an interesting point, which is, um, and it's something that I didn't understand as a, as a, cause I, so I got into D and D at high school, I actually got D D in elementary school. So I've been playing since I was seven. Um, but one of the points you make is D and D was also going through a transition where it was realizing it probably was made for college students or at least adults. And um, then they saw with the basic rules, what a huge opportunity it was to market to kids, but the pivot didn't happen immediately. Of course, you know, when you look at history, it feels like it did, but it didn't. Um, and certainly uh, basic was supposedly a track to get to advanced, right? So if you started out with basic and it was kid friendly, advanced may not have been uh, when you saw that, you know, some of those monsters and, and at the levels of clothing that they were wearing. So it was really interesting because um, I think that's happening again, right? So when you talk about challenges, one of the challenges is that D and D is expanding its roots. It's it's for everybody, right? And if we if we always say, you know, the 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 promise of role playing is you can be anything you want. Um, that theoretically appeals to everyone from all walks of life, be it gender orientation, whatever. Uh, and I think the game is finally recognizing its its full potential, right? Which is that if it's an imaginative game, anyone can come to it. The reality, though, is that it wasn't always for everybody. Um, it was very much for usually, you know, educated white guys, essentially. Uh, and now it's starting to see that potential. So one of the things that we've seen as a challenge for Car PGA is is really ensuring we support that diversity um, and get it because it is it's out there now and it's global. But um, you know, a lot of times the challenge is those older gamers accepting the new, you know, the new audiences, the new kids coming in who have very different ideas. You know, our favorite conversation is around um, trauma and respecting it, right? Which is sort of, you know, maybe if you, thank, if, God bless you if you didn't have a trauma where it couldn't be triggered during a game. But now because we have a massive new player base, they come with their own challenges. And some of that is trauma and we have to respect that. And if there's tools that help them avoid, you know, unpleasant situations, fine. Um, but it is one of those things that's new to a game where it was just assumed you always play with your buddies and everybody sort of knew everybody pretty well and it wasn't an issue. So, you know, those are the kinds of changes we're starting to see where um, we think and, I, you know, I'm not there's no way to easily prove this, that part of the problem is when we realize that it's us, we went so much from the satanic panic to be like, you know, I, I, I was constantly defending myself against uh, the public. Well, now you're like, oh, wait a minute, I'm not the minority anymore. <laughs> Um, I've got to sort of think a big picture and, and welcome other people. And I think that's one of the ships and pivots that the Carpegiers tried to do um, and, and say, you know, we're not going to fight these sort of religious institutions, not even religious institutions, to your point. It's, it's, it's a very specific group. Um, we're not going to we're not here to fight them. Not that we wouldn't, but that we, that's not our goal. It's really now to say, OK, the next stage is really making sure we're open to everybody. Uh, and that sometimes means looking at our own biases and prejudices, too. So hopefully, um, you know, I think the internet's blown it wide open. I think that, that, that there's no going back, whether or not we, people yeah. own role playing, whether you like it or not, they own D and D or they like it or not. So hopefully uh, we'll see more diversity and inclusion as it goes on. You know, I wouldn't say there's no going back because um, it seems in history, the imagination always draws, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's attackers and it's critics. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah. you know, whether, I mean, you know, I, like I did a project on CS Lewis and, and J.R.R. Tolkien like I mean, Jack Schick went after them too. Um, and he retracted that because a, a generation had grown up reading that uh, C.S. Lewis and Tolkien. And they were like, well, wait a minute, you can't, you can't take them out. You know, you can't go after them. So yep. Jack Schick actually quickly adjusted his, his cartoons. Um, <laughs> but, you know, like, I mean, I mean, Lewis and Tolkien, I mean, they, you know, people say, you know, uh, C.S. Lewis's work, Narnia, oh, you know, it's kind of lighthearted and childlike. Well, it's, it's very much like Harry Potter. It starts like that, and it gets into the real greediness of life and, right. and the bigger ideas in life. Um, so, yeah, the way it's written is a little bit lighter, kind of like Harry Potter. Of course, Tolkien just sort of goes for it, except with The Hobbit, of, of course. Right. But they, they all had their detractors. I mean, Madeline Lengel uh, had her detractors, too. Um, and, you know, she was throwing out ideas, big ideas and, and, and playing with ideas, uh, universalism, and that kind of thing, um, which was really interesting. But th to your point, the one thing I found really interesting was looking at the old gaming, um, war gaming photos from back in the 60s and 70s. There was a lot of women in there. And that surprised mm -hmm. me because there was somehow there was a shift. I can't answer what happened. But within Dungeons and Dragons, there's a lot less um, females all of a sudden. 
And I know uh, my daughter argued, yeah, but Stranger Things had a girl playing. I'm like, yeah, but that, <laughs> Stranger Things wasn't the actual 80s. Um, but it's great that they do put that put that representation in there um, because I'm sure there was a lot of girls that missed out in the 1980s because it was kind of like a boys club, right? Totally, totally. And, and uh, I, I often laugh at my current online group because of COVID. We haven't been able to play in person in a long time, but uh, online, my group is 50%. Uh, they identify as female. Um, so it was just fascinating to be like, wow, what a, you know, you kind of look around and go, what a change. Uh, and they're very often parents who are teaching their kids. So we also take notes and then we run our own games uh, afterwards. But what a difference, right? Um, where it's just a different world uh, of who's playing. And, and uh, I think, you know, I, we've looked back and it was ironic because Gary Gygax's playtesters were his kids. You know, so yeah. there were kids there. And to your point, you know, there were women actively, we know they were actively engaged in the development and, and helping of the game. But somehow, uh, you know, they it, for some reason it became not, uh, you know, they weren't as engaged or involved. So it's so great to see it um, that we're sort of mm -hmm. we're, we're ex you know, expanding the base as it, we should be. Again, as, if the imagination is you can be whoever you want, you certainly can be any gender you want. You could certainly be any species you want. So then why would it reject who could play if you can be whoever you want? Um, so this is awesome. That's a whole other show. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, so what's, but, in, so what's in the future for you? Speaking of the whole other show. So do you think there's going to be any more role-playing related uh, topics or geek related I, topics? I, I don't know. Uh, it's whatever my interest holds, but, but just, uh, I'm going to make one quick point though. Yes, Derek, Derek White, the geek preacher, Derek White, um, he's on TikTok all the time. Um, and, and, you know, he, he's done really well with it. He's a Methodist minister. Mm -hmm. Um, he's like an official gaming minister now they've actually recognized him. Uh, so he, he talked a little bit about exclusion and inclusion and how back in the day that these were the kids that were usually bullied and they were the outsiders and they found their group. And he talked, he talked about it on TikTok, how they started building defensive walls because they needed to protect their group. And yep. somehow, you know, sometimes that can become really negative and you, you, that creates your own elite group or, or, or private group that you keep these people out and those people out. And so he said, it's important to always unpack that. And, totally. you know, you go from being inclusive, bringing in people who are the other downtrodden geeks and, and, and that kind of thing. But then all of a sudden it starts to reverse and you start to build your walls. I thought that was a fascinating uh, comment, commentary that he made on TikTok. Um, but as for what I'm working on, uh, I'm working on a murder series uh, right now uh, as a producer slash director, uh, sort of a docu-series that kind of looks at uh, not the blood and gore, uh, but more the the tragedy of what families have to go through to get closure and uh that sort of plugs into some of my previous work that i did and uh i'm right now trying to frantically finish uh, a documentary on the mennonites in of manitoba that moved to mexico in the 1920s after they had a clash uh it's actually a fascinating story and uh it was it was a grant that was given to us from a, a really wonderful organization that said they really wanted to tell this story and uh, we were like okay and because we kind of thought COVID was going to be like sort of sitting low uh, for part of it. So we kind of panicked and we were like, all right, let's just keep, you know, keep pulling in projects. And uh, so that's what I'm working on right now, uh, a series, but then also sort of a small one hour documentary on, on, on that, which is surprisingly actually connects, plugs into sort of people fighting the governments and, and rights and language. Uh, that's fantastic. Uh oh, I think I think I'm getting a delay here. Sorry. Oh, waiting for it to catch up. There we go. Um, that's great. So uh, in terms of where can we find the movie? That's probably the first question and the documentary. Yeah. And then sort of where can we follow what you're doing? You know, in Canada, it's going to be up here on Super Channel Fuse uh, Network. Uh, in the U.S., uh, it's just going to be doing festivals right now. But probably in the next two to three months, we'll be able to announce. Uh, we have a distributor in the U.S. and it's just a matter of time. Um, it, it, was, it was really interesting getting it done. Um, a lot of it is fair use, obviously. Um, but it was just like a slow process of digging up things. Paul Storm Stormberg, uh, he's kind of like a TSR archivist who works oh, with yes. a lot of people, yeah. a lot of collections. Uh, he was really helpful. He was great uh, in, in helping us uh, sort of put this together. But, uh, you know, a lot of it is uh, we use reenactments uh, because uh, we just had to. <laughs> we, <laughs> there wasn't materials. I, you know, one of the questions I always ask, well, is there a TSR picture from this? It's like, well, People didn't have camera phones and they were busy playing the game. Uh, I was repeatedly told that, like, we were busy playing Dungeons and Dragons. We didn't, nobody had a camera. It was like, okay, everybody. Um, but, you know, uh, it's too bad. Too bad that somebody didn't have a 16 millimeter or an 8 millimeter 
Um, so we, we had to reenact and, and, and do some of that. That's fantastic. Uh, we can't wait to see it. So, you know, certainly what we're going to do is um, once once it comes out, we'll be sure to bolster it, uh, like it, share it. Um, cool. what, what's your website? I want to make sure we have that on uh, refuge31.com. Okay. Refuge31.com. Is there any socials yeah. you should be following or? Uh, you know, uh, the geek creature, uh, he's on TikTok. He's on a variety of, he's on Facebook. Um, he, uh, he's the one who's, who's, uh, is really connected with social right now. Uh, in fact, last week, our, our website updated, uh, did an automatic update. And so it's a little bit off the rails right now. It's there, it's back up, but we're actually redoing it for the next week. Uh, when it, when, uh, this documentary actually comes out on, uh, up in Canada. So hopefully in the next week or so, it'll all be refreshed and all that, but refuge 31.com refuge 31.com. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 uh, we're doing a, I'm a scout leader for my boy scout troop and we had like the site updated itself and blew itself up, you know, just like one yep. day at the worst time. And of course we use that for selling things for scouts and that's the way it goes. You know, there's tools just uh, do what they want. <laughs> they have a mind of their own, but good luck with that. I, I think it's all there. See- yeah, I it looks it's good. There, but there's, if you if you scroll all the way down, there's code all the way down. Oh, <laughs> it's like, really? okay. where's that code? I didn't and know. I, I, I've been on there. It looked okay to me, but to your point, okay. I probably didn't go to the, to the bottom to see. Uh... Maybe it got fixed. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, there it is. I see it. Yep, that's what that no, is. There I you got go. it. <laughs> well, that's great, and we'll happen to uh, do that. And uh, anything else you wanted to add? Because we'll we'll open up to questions. We have we, this is a pretty good group here, so I want to open up for questions. Oh, cool. But, uh, anything, anything else you, I want to add? Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I think it's, uh, it's not just about the eighties. It's the most relevant story, you know, and, 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 you know, I don't know, good, good story just keeps on retelling itself. Unfortunately, satanic panic and conspiracy, the granddaddy of conspiracy theories keeps telling itself over and over, but that's why it's all the more relative, uh, talking about a bunch of kids in the eighties. Totally. It, it is for, for better or worse, as much as I, I keep hoping we can move on to it, to your point, it morphs. Uh, and it doesn't go away, right? So um, it is something that we're it's going to be with us. And I think the biggest mistake we could do is forget it. So I think it's fantastic mm-hmm. that you've been, um, you know, you're helping us remember. Because that's one of the things I think that's a challenge too, is we've got sh- certainly the first generation who did this, we've got to make sure we capture their stories. Um, but then there's mm-hmm. the next generation who consumed it, which is my generation, who, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, I think probably now that we're adults, we're having a different perspective than we did when we were kids. And as I was mentioning to you earlier, some of my experiences were not uh, not what I'd be okay with as an adult parent. If my my child went through some of the things that I went through as a kid that I thought was interesting or funny or fun to argue with adults, I would have been horrified. Um, so, yeah, no, it's definitely as we become as we become the adults, we start looking at things differently for sure. So it's good to have that lens too. All right, so um, I think we're going to open it up to questions. It looks like we have a good group here. Uh, I don't know if anyone had any questions. I, I see we have eight members, which is fantastic. It's a this is a new personal best here. Um, anybody have any questions? Yes, I, uh, I would like to. Oh, my friend Sylvia. Hello, Sylvia. Yeah, hello. Uh-huh. <laughs> First, uh, just a, a comment to you, Mike. Uh, when you say that uh, the role playing game is made for a. Uh, uh, a kind of group, a close group, or mm-hmm. I mean, uh, it, I, I can tell you once more that it's not true, mm-hmm. because uh, when when we deal with myths, uh, mythology, because when you when you write you, you uh, a story uh, with uh, mythological uh, characters, so this is mythology. The mythology, uh, it, it, how can I put that? Uh, the mythology uh, reaches everyone. It's a universal, uh, universal thought. I don't know how to put this in English. You know that my English is not so good, <laughs> but. <laughs> The mythology is, is universal in terms of uh, it's reachable for everyone, where everyone can reach it. That's why I play look, with a success, a great success, uh, role playing games with children of the street that were uh, illiterate. Yes. 
Yes. I was thinking of you, Sylvia, when we talked about this. So are you saying um, yes. that it, it's it's more open or less open in terms of gaming? What, what, what was your point with that? Extremely open. Yes, totally. The, but now the... the when you you were talking about uh, uh, the role playing game and the, the the religion thing, yes, <laughs> and this is to to our guests, yes. Uh, don't you think at least curious that the Bible, mainly the new one that was written by people that were paid. To, to to give some importance to to some 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 kings or I mean some uh, you know we you know don't you think it curious that even the Bible is a it's a story not not completely a history but a story storytelling in some some places and, and that. There is a parallel with our mythology, Dungeons and Dragons, and and all this this beautiful uh, uh, open universe of role playing games. There is a parallel. Totally. And why? So and why the religious people <laughs> insist to condemn the role playing games? No, and I think I yeah, think exactly. this is the imagination point that you know, and that's the title, right? Andrew is sort of imagination. There's a reason you got you named it imagination. Go ahead. Yeah, well, yeah, it's it's the satanic panic and the religious battle for the imagination. And yeah, I mean the reality is there's people of the world that that do not like imagination. And those are the people that see the Bible as a rigid sort of rule book uh, and a source of power. Uh, there's power in that, right? In owning the rules and controlling the rules, right? And uh, then on the flip side, yeah, exactly your point. This beautiful story, this mythology that carries us through and helps us sort of understand the bigger ideas and, 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 and how we're supposed to get along on this planet. Uh, so I would agree 100%. Uh, but your question, why did these religious people do it? I, there's, there's always people that are going to misconstrue power, right? And I think if you play the game Dungeons and Dragons, there's always those, that character too, that there's somebody that's going to abuse their power. And hopefully you have a good dungeon master who's going to, Who's gonna control them? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you for your question, I, Jeremiah. I I actually was smart enough to look at the chat thing. I saw your hand raised, so Jeremiah, go ahead. And no worries, uh, Jeremiah Kaplan. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, and I I kind of wanted to just comment about this idea of embedding role playing games, specifically Dungeons and Dragons and others, in religious educational settings and institutions. So I've been using Dungeons and Dragons to teach fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh grade students, um, both locally here in Phoenix, but also when COVID hit remotely uh, for going on, this is over three years now. And having the idea of using character development as a way to express creativity, but also identity in that particular age group has been incredibly effective. Um, in fact, I'm expanding my efforts this coming fall in uh, in some of the high school realms and I'll be moving uh, into other kinds of areas and, and exploring ways to use games for just different sort of I would say positive intent at least um, so I think that's not just it's not just mainstream we're actually looking at some intrinsic benefit to using this idea of story a story that can help connect people and connect people to themselves and so just to comment that there's a lot more open-mindedness now than, than there was before in, in some circles. And, and it's been really neat to see some of that um, and to be part of it, I guess, it just in, in my small little corner of the world here. But um, so I just wanted to comment to that. Totally. And I, I mean, Andrew, you mentioned there was, um, you know, you've got people who are using the ministries, they're using the gaming. Are they using it as education or just for sort of the youth group or to Jeremiah's point, are they using it for education? Like, are they just playing D&D independent of the religion itself or are they using it as a teaching tool? What, what was the, the case studies that they were referencing in the, in the documentary? 
I think whether intentionally or not, uh, we don't get too much into that, but intentionally or not, it is a teaching tool, no matter what. It's a social skill. I mean, there's a bit of math in there too, not as much as there used to be <laughs> back in the day. Um, but, you know, anytime you're exercising your brain, your imagination, um, that's really important. I mean, uh, going back to some of my previous documentaries, I mean, play is uh, where we unpack the really big things, right? And so I know, I know a couple of like, I know a lot of PhDs. Uh, people, right? Really brilliant in their fields. And they love, you know, Dungeons and Dragons. They love reading Tolkien. They love all that imaginative stuff. And, and that helps them actually process things, um, you know, by, by parking their brain in that world. Uh, it helps them uh, unpack the ideas in this world and, and think through things, but also give them, you know, uh, you know, feel out those ideas, moral, right, and wrong, and uh, the social interaction. So to, to your comment, I mean, I, it doesn't matter how you play Dungeons and Dragons. I guess there is some way you could, but uh, for the most part, you, it is a teaching tool, no matter what. Anytime you're you're doing play and with the imagination like that, it is it is doing a lot of things. You know, we interviewed somebody who we we unfortunately it was a it was a long story, but we had to cut it. But um, their their disabled child um, used role playing to live out the things that she physically couldn't do. And that really, you know, really uh, re major disabilities. Um, that was her way of, of sort of stepping out and doing something bigger uh, and using her mind for that. But there was also a story about a, a, a military unit in Iraq that things went really badly over there. And so they actually would role play the battle scenario to show the commander uh, or the, 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 the guy that was, that was uh, running the unit that he did the best he could. And there was, there was, you know, they, they played that outcome over and over to show them, no, this is, you know, and that was their way of dealing with post-traumatic stress and, wow. and, and the guilt and, and pain. Right. So there's, there's so many ways that role playing, I mean, the psychologists are using it now, right. To, to, to your point, um, you know, in, in teachers. And uh, I think, you know, the interaction unto itself is so important for kids today to be face to face with somebody and actually interacting, not just on a screen in a text. That's excellent. Wow. That's now, is that in the documentary that, that, that the war? Uh, yeah. Well, at the end, we talk about it. Yeah. Excellent. But the, the story about the disabled girl, no, unfortunately it was just, it was a long story to unpack. And uh, you know, I, I know some, some of my critics are going to say it's a little too long. It's uh, 86 minutes. Um, but that's because uh, we have a broadcaster. You needed it long. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, I, I, I think anybody who gets into it will, will be probably some people will complain that it's too short. Um, we didn't explain a lot of the things, the Dave Arnes and Gary Gygax thing, I didn't want to touch at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, thank you for sharing because it's great to see that. I saw another hand. Marianne, did you have a question? I know you took your hand down. I don't want you to be disappointed. Well, I just noticed that it was almost eight. That's so okay. I was trying to be mindful. Uh, Andrew, can you can you stay on for one more question? I, uh, yeah, sure, of course. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Go ahead, Marianne. I mean, don't speaking of the fair, it's not, it's not really a question. It's a connection. Um, so I'm Marianne Cullinan. I'm in Antrim, New Hampshire, and I'm a PhD student at Leslie University, and I'm studying this, not the satanic panic, but um, role-playing games. And I think, Andrew, what I'm hearing you say and what I'm hearing Jeremiah say, um, there's this guy named Gary Allen Fine, who was the first person who really, um, really studied D&D. Mm -hmm. And there are what he, you sort of talked about this and this is what I see too. I have um, 65 kids in my D and D group at my middle school, which is um, a third of the school. Wow. And yeah. And because middle schoolers love to role play, but there's three frames. Right. And I think this is why, or one of the reasons why um, people love D and D and role playing games is there's the you as a person frame where you have to get along with the other players at the table. There's the, you as a game player, like a strategic player who's looking in their inventory to find the rope so that you can beat the challenge. And then there's the diegetic frame, the in-story frame. And, and that bleed between the frames is where the learning is, I, I think too, right? Where, where that girl who can't physically do those things is still having the emotional experience of that success. Or when I burn, go into the 
village and I burn down the orphanage and then I go to jail, I get to experience natural consequences without actually burning down any small orphanages, right? right. So I think it's so fascinating what you're talking about. And, and I guess as someone who's involved with middle school, this perspective of the satanic panic because like I was a girl in the early 90s. So I wasn't like invited to play D&D <laughs> in the basement. <laughs> um, but I think just that's the fear, right? That, that you're having these experiences that are expanding you in a different way. And um, I really appreciate hearing about your work and I, I can't wait to see your movie. So I guess that's my not question. But cool, thanks. Um, you know, it's interesting you talk about the first part is studying D&D. Um, Harry Potter, uh, when it came out, there was a very conservative university in the US. I think it was North Carolina. Um, I might be wrong on that. And uh, Amy, who's one of the people I interviewed in my documentary, well, her, her sort of the head of her department said, who was very conservative, saw they were burning Harry Potter's down the road. And so she went and bought it and then came in the next week and said, hey, uh, we're going to do a, an actual class on this. And so there was another university right at the same time uh, that, uh, that, that did a class on Harry Potter, but that hers did it too. And she was the, the person to teach it. She's in the fantasy makers as well that there's something actually really important and interesting in the storytelling. And other than that, the cultural impact that Harry Potter, Potter, had, Potter had, that uh, you can't not study it. It's important. And Dr. Fine's work, I interviewed him for my book actually, um, is it really helped. He, he was groundbreaking in sort of the work he did to sort of help define what was happening in role-playing. He's, he's one of my, <laughs> he's the one who said everybody cheats. <laughs> everybody cheats on their <laughs> dice rolls he's like it just happens and that you, you bring that up today and people lose their minds but he was like yeah everybody did. they all admitted they did and it was in the book and people were like you you can't say that we're like ah, it's because it's flexible and it's different frames and it's a part of the game yeah the dice says some things but everybody cheats cheating being a you know a phrase that is uh laden with you know the assumption is you're breaking a rule but that, he was the one who, who put that on record so um thank you very much Marianne for that I appreciate it all right, so we are at time. I do want to be respectful for your time, Andrew. I appreciate you taking no, it. Yeah. So gracious. Um, no, thank you for having me on. We're gonna we're we're, we're not gonna let you go though. So we're just gonna follow you around and <laughs> cover your work and uh, certainly help amplify it. Um, I will say that uh, for those of you folks who aren't CarPGA members, um, you're welcome to uh, join us. So if you are getting this from the Facebook or the LinkedIn group and you're not officially in the group now. Um, we have the carpga.org slash join us. Uh, it's on there. And also we will absolutely link to the video. We'll put the video, you know, link up there once it's up, especially because it mentions the CarPGA. So it will have a permanent uh, connection and home for us. Um, this video will, of course, go out and we're going to make sure we have all those links um, to Andrew's work and, and all the fantastic things he's doing, as well as obviously the documentary when it comes out. But we'll have this recording so that'll be a good reminder and sort of um, lay the framework with, I, I think this, this is a great uh, companion piece to the documentary to have some of the thinking and, and some of the f philosophy behind uh, all this. So thank you so much, Andrew, for being a guest. Everything uh, you're doing, please keep doing it. Um, please involve <laughs> us when you can. Uh, we're, we're excited. You do. We hope you come back to the gaming topic more. Uh, maybe there's more opportunities. Yeah. But, um, but we'll definitely make sure uh, it gets as wide distribution as we can help uh, get it. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. I very much appreciate it.